It was confusing and astonishing. A mighty wind blowing inside the house, tongues of fire that didn't burn but brought life instead. Many languages spoken, yet everybody understood. Bewildering, amazing, words just can't quite grasp the wonder of what happened that first Pentecost day. For no words can contain the power of the spirit that is still alive, the spirit that touches us with life, that fills us with joy, that causes us to praise God as we join together in our call to worship. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Be the wind and the fire that transforms our lives. Lean <clears throat> us as we study your word of life. Kindle faith from our believing doubt. Cleanse us from our waywardness. Deepen our passion for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give us voice to proclaim your <clears throat> mighty works in every tongue. Fill your church with power. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, here we are again once in your presence. And to be in your presence is overwhelming. It is truly overwhelming to try to grasp what that really means, especially on this Pentecost Sunday. The promise of Pentecost is the promise of power, power to be peacemakers in a world that's torn by violence, the power to forgive our own guilt and the guilt of others, the power to be courageous in the face of danger. Because of Pentecost, we believe that you desire to do great things in us and through us, and we don't want to get in the way. We know, Lord, all too well our best play, laid plans and uh, well-meant intentions are all futile apart from your presence. So as we worship this morning, help us to feel, to hear, to breathe in that Pentecost spirit. Embolden us to testify to your presence in the world, to exemplify your love for all of humanity, to open our hearts to being radically changed by your spirit. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.
that you want to go at any cost. And I remember laying there with you know, tears streaming down my face for, I don't know, I didn't measure the time, I'm guessing 20 minutes, 30 minutes, where the tears streamed down my face under the pillowcase. And uh, as, as the Lord had prayed the scenes, and then he would want to know, did you mean when you said more at any cost? And, and when the scenes stopped and I was left with just the presence of God, of God upon me and the realization that although I heard no voice, it was asking the question, did you mean it when you said you want more than you cost? And I, I, I said, yes, I'll pay any price. If I never function as a normal human being the rest of my life, it's fine. If I am mocked, if I'm misunderstood, it doesn't matter to me. And uh, that went on all night long, the uh, next night, the third night, three nights in a row. And it was, it was this encounter with the Lord that prepared me. Today is Pentecost Sunday. This is the uh, this is the day that we celebrate the birthday of the church. This is the time when the church was born. And judging from uh, the level of excitement that I see in the congregation this morning, that little piece of liturgical trivia is probably about as exciting as well, it's about as exciting as a bowl of cream of wheat. Um, it's always interesting to me. Uh, birthdays, I don't know how they are at your house, but at my house, birthdays are always a time for celebration. I mean, even if you don't, even if you're really not crazy about having another birthday or getting another year older, boy, I do like to get that gift, you know? I do like to get them presents, so I'd have two birthdays a year if I could get presents both times, you know? So, but there are always times of, of excitement. People are excited, the kids, the grandkids, everybody's excited. It's a time of great energy, and yet, when it comes to the birthday of the church, it's kind of like, well, oh, 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 Pentecost again, you know, and we just kind of pass it off, and uh, it becomes, this Sunday becomes really not much different from any other Sunday. You know, we know that it will be time for the sermon at exactly, oh, at exactly 1137, uh, today, we also uh, know that the Spirit will leave promptly at 12 o'clock. Uh, the only rushing of mighty wind that we'll experience is that of people going out the door in a hurry trying to beat the Baptists over to the k and I think sometimes we need to reclaim what it really truly means for us to be a people of Pentecost, to be a Pentecost church. Uh, Pentecost granted the church power, power to be the disciples of Christ. And that's, a, that's an awesome thing. It's a very awesome responsibility. And so as we, uh, as we prepare for our time of prayer this morning, as we look toward confessing our sins, let us remember those times when we've taken the church for granted. 
that Jesus Christ indeed gave himself for his bride, as the song says, so that the church not only would be born, but would survive. So let us confess our sins now before God and before each other. The Spirit of God, you come to us as a powerful wind, but we have shut the door and bolted it to try to keep you out. You descend on us as tongues of fire, but we run away, afraid of being consumed. You give us gifts beyond our ability, but we squander them, we hide them. We say, not today, or how can one person make a difference? Or no, Lord, not me. On this day of Pentecost, forgive our feebleness. Break open the doors of resistance. Let the fire of your spirit dance within each of us and give us courage and faith to claim your call on our lives. Brothers and sisters, give all the glory and all the praise to God Almighty. For in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. <clears throat> Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning on behalf of uh, a lot of folks who uh, can't speak for themselves. They may not have the strength to pray. They may not have the words to communicate effectively the hurting that they feel in their souls and their, in their bodies. We know through your word that you see us inside and out, that you know us through and through that you're not unfamiliar with the things that we suffer in this life. And so we ask that you would reach out to these that are hurting, that you would let them know once again that you are real, that you are ever-present, that your heart breaks for them. We ask that you be with Jeff, with Thomas, with Joe. Lord, we glorify you today for the gift and the power of the Spirit. We praise you for that great and spectacular outpouring of the Spirit on that first Pentecost, for the launching of your church in power and the miraculous unity that the church enjoys. We are thankful for the Spirit's might in convicting us of sin over and over again, those times when we get smug or self-righteous, lazy, callous, holier than thou. We're thankful for the Spirit's skill in reminding us that Self-interest often lies at the very root of some of the very best things that we do. We give you thanks for the miracle of your spirit or the mirror of your spirit in which we see ourselves not as others see us, but far more disturbingly as you see us. Let this day and this service become a kind of personal Pentecost for many of us. Renew the church beginning with us with each of us, with all of us. And teach us through your spirit how we might proclaim the good news of your faithfulness and love in, in new and effective ways. We pray in the name of the one to whom your spirit bears witness, the Lord of Pentecost, the Lord of the church, our Lord Jesus Christ who taught us how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. of every song we could ever sing 
worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you. First of our scripture lessons for this morning on this Pentecost Sunday comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 3 through 13. Now, no one could say that Jesus is the Lord without the insight of the Spirit. 
God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everybody gets in on it. Everybody benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit into all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. Wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out by one, one by one by the Spirit of God. He decides who gets what and when. Now you can easily see how this kind of thing works by really looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still just one body. And it's the same with Christ. By means of his one Spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal selves and we each used our to independently call our own shots but then we entered into a large and integrated life in which he has the final say in everything and this is what we proclaimed in word and action when we were baptized each of us is now part of his resurrection body refreshed sustained at one fountain his spirit where we all come to drink the old labels that we used to identify ourselves, labels like Jew or Greek or slave or free, well, they're no longer useful. We need something larger. We need something a lot more comprehensive. Our second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. Later on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful Jews, they had kind of locked all the doors in the house. And then all of a sudden, Jesus was standing there in the midst of them, and he said, Peace to you. And then he showed them his, his hands, his side. And the disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were exuberant. And Jesus repeated his greeting. He said, Peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I send you. And then he took a deep breath, and he breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, then what are you going to do with them? Let us pray. The Holy Spirit, as the scripture is read, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear the truth, that you would shine a light where we cling to darkness, that you would convict us where there is a need that you would call forth from us the passion, the joy to respond to your word to us today. For the sake of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The focal text for the message this morning comes from the second chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 21. Now, when Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and without warning, there was this sound like a like a strong wind, gale force. Nobody could tell where it came from, and it filled the whole building. And then like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages that the Spirit prompted them. Now, there were a lot of Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, pilgrims from all over the world, and when they heard the sound, why, they came on running. And then when they heard, one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken while they were just thunderstruck. Couldn't quite for the life of them figure out what was going on. And they kept saying to one another, aren't all these Galileans? I mean, how is it we're able to hear them talk in our mother tongues? They're speaking our languages, describing the mighty works of God. Their heads were spinning. They just they couldn't make heads or tails out of it. They talked back and forth, confused. But there were others, there's always others. They were kind of joking, and they said, oh, they just don't pay no attention to them. They just drunk on cheap wine. And about that time, Peter stood up, and he, backed by the other 11, spoke out boldly. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully, and I want you to get this story straight. These folks aren't drunk like some of you might suspect. 
They may have time to get drunk. It's just now 9 o'clock in the morning. This instead is what the prophet Joel announced will happen. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on every kind of person. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. When that time comes, I will pour out my spirit on everybody who serves me, men and women both, and they will prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky, signs in the earth, blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black. The moon blood red before the day of the Lord arrives, that day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to me, God will be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. From all descriptions that we have in the book of Acts, chapter 2 especially, Pentecost was a high energy event. You got your flames of fire. You got fierce winds ripping through the area. And whenever you've got unexplained sources of energy, then you're going to attract a lot of attention. And that they did. If you study the search for energy, it really winds up being uh, a history of humankind as a whole. Energy has been an important part of what it means for us to be human, uh, and it, it is absolutely necessary for our survival, so much so that uh, we've even developed mythologies built around the, the ways in which human beings acquired uh, our access to energy. If you're up on your Greek mythology, then you remember, of course, Prometheus and how uh, Prometheus brought fire to uh, from the gods down to, to humanity and, and how stringently he was punished for doing that. To have energy is to have power and to have control. And that is a truth that is all too evident as we, even now in the 21st century, look at the current geopolitical climate climate over in the Middle East. And see, so that's part of the reason why we are always interested in alternative sources of energy. It really doesn't make any difference whether that's, whether that's biofuels or geothermal or nuclear or hydroelectric or solar or even methane gas. You know, cows produce a tremendous amount of methane. They, scientists project that cows throughout globally now, throughout the world, produce millions of metric tons of methane gas every year. There's only one little problem. Researchers have never really found a way <laughs> that you could harness this, uh, this uh, source of methane from our bovine friends in order to power automobiles and to uh, heat and cool our homes. Speaking of wind... This reminds us of a lot of communities, especially in the western United States, where uh, they have begun to do something called wind farming. They, they farm wind to harvest literally an unexpected source and amount of energy. And you've, you've probably seen the pictures. You've uh, seen these uh, uh, videos, these uh, pictures of uh, farms that just appear to be miles and miles of nothing but, uh, but these wind turbines, which are not dissimilar to the old-fashioned windmills. And they install these on farmland where there is a, a fairly strong and a fairly steady breeze. Those rotors uh, turn and uh, generate electricity for home, businesses, families, utilities, and they do so in probably one of the cleanest and most efficient manners possible without actually disturbing the agricultural use of the land. Farmers can still farm around those great big towers. The potential that these wind turbines has is absolutely staggering. Wind energy in the future may be able to supply as much as 20% of the nation's electricity, and this energy is everywhere. Wind blows anywhere and everywhere. North Dakota alone is theoretically capable of producing enough wind-generated power to meet more than one-third of all the demands of electricity in the United States. Now, that's a lot. Now, admittedly, there's still a few bugs that need to be worked out, as it turns out, quite literally. 
Workers at these wind farms have noticed for a long time that these electricity-generating wind turbines were plagued by very strange and uh, unexpected fluctuations in their power output. They searched for a long time, tried to figure it out, and never could until one scientist stumbled on to the answer, and the mystery was solved. Uh, the mystery, as it turns out, is smushed bugs. Insects will accumulate on those turbine propellers. They add aerodynamic drag to the propellers. They siphon off as much as a quarter of the energy that those wind turbines will produce in a year. So let's now go back to the upper room at Pentecost, look at some of those special effects that went along with it. The church, if not to push a metaphor too far, the church also is kind of a wind farm, if you think about it. It was the powered by the Spirit of God, which was a wind that blew through, you see, that first Pentecost. It's described like the rush of a mighty wind. It filled those apostles that were gathered there, gave them the ability to speak other languages, which they used to preach the gospel to all those various people that were standing outside wondering what in the name of Sam Hill was going on. Now, I might just add as an aside here, just as a PSA, public service announcement, you know, when the Bible speaks here about uh, tongues, it's not talking about that gobbledygook that you hear on the televangelistic shows. These were real languages. These were actual languages that people spoke, which meant that the disciples learned languages they had no business knowing simply so that they could communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ with people who so very desperately needed to hear it. What's more, here you have Peter, who once stood in the courtyard and denied that he even knew Jesus Christ in front of a little girl, you know, because he was afraid. Here now Peter has the courage to stand up and preach to this crowd with, with, some of the, with boldness, with courage, with conviction. And he promises, that, promises the crowd that everybody that calls on the name of the Lord is going to be saved. And it wasn't just a few minutes that uh, that news kind of spread like electricity through the crowd and jolted by this magnificent offer. offer 3,000 people repented and were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now that's what I would call wind-generated church growth. The wind of God is a powerful thing. It's a spirit that can fill, it can teach, it can inspire, it can convert people in any age, any nation, but like the large turbine farms today, we American Christians in the 21st century don't always make good or efficient use of this power that's been given to us. We don't move smoothly and swiftly when we feel the breath of God. We don't allow for the Holy Spirit to flow at full power within our community of faith. Bottom line is this, boys and girls, we're suffering from bug buildup. So what are these infernal insects? What are these nasty little swarmers that are clogging up our turbines and are preventing us from making full use of that wind power of the Holy Spirit? Well, let's see if we can spot them and squat them before they get us all gummed up. First, you have Christianus Comfortableus. This is the bug of comfortable Christianity. This bug doesn't want to put any time or any energy into learning anything much less the languages of the Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the residents of Mesopotamia. Creatures like this aren't comfortable with cultures in east of the Eastern Europeans, of Middle Easterners, Asians, or South Americans. They don't even want to venture outside their own little narrow comfort zones and speak to Americans who might uh, be of a, another race or belong to a different economic group or different, different political organization or have a different orientation. They just want to deal with folks just like them. And as a result of that, well, the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't go much of anywhere and it does it real fast. And then you have stupor intellectualis. This is the bug of intellectual laziness. Bug buildup with this pest creates a situation in which the 
Christian, while interested, you know, in studying the Word of God, just never quite seems to get around to it, you know? When you have a church that is populated with folks whose intentions are only pretensions, then the windmills of the faith are going to come to a slow screeching halt. Bug, uh, buggered by this bug, we, we don't know Abraham from Andrew, Daniel from Dorcas, Matthew from Mark. And because of this, we don't realize, like Peter did, that the coming of the Holy Spirit was a fulfillment on that Pentecost day of what the prophet Joel had said eons ago. In those last days, it will be, the Lord says, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. There's also solo individualis. That is the bug of the individual only. Here's a person's personal faith or their spirituality as a, a strictly private affair. You know, we do that a lot. People say, well, you know, my spirituality is, that's really between me and God. You know what you tell me when you say that? It tells me you ain't got no spirituality at all. That's just your cop out. It's kind of like folks talk about, well, you know, I don't tithe because, well, you know what I give is between me and God. And I go, well, I'm willing to bet you ain't giving all that much to God. See, we hide behind those things. We claim it's a strictly private affair. And we don't want any of that to be complicated by any faithful connections to a community of any kind. This is kind of the subtext of the, I believe in God, but I ain't got no time for church crowd. You know, those folks who say, well, you know, I'm spiritual, but I ain't religious. Now, I don't know how you do that. Jesus and the disciples never, and write this down, they never make community an option. You know, it's never in that drop down box. It's never in one of those boxes to check off. It's never even brought up for consideration. It is assumed. It is difficult, if not downright impossible, for a Christian to grow in isolation. The practice of the early church bears this out. We are told that they devoted, uh, the Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread, praying, day by day as they spent time together in the temple. Fellowship, breaking bread together, spending time in worship, Without these aspects of the community life, the Christian faith just really isn't the Christian faith. And then you also run into a nasty little critter called the neglectum supplicationis. That is the bug that neglects to pray. That is the bug that neglects to lift up joys and concerns and requests in prayer. One of the things I'm impressed with when I read the book of Acts is that the early church, they were a praying bunch of folks. They didn't really have much else going for them, so what they had, they used, and boy, they went after it with gusto. They prayed and they prayed. In fact, there's one point at which it says they prayed so hard that the walls of the church shook. Well, if we prayed that hard today, it'd scare you poor old Methodists to death. You wouldn't know how to act. Probably scare them Baptists down the road, too, you see. We are encouraged to pray. We are told to pray. Prayer is not the movement of last resort for Christians. It is our primary line of defense. It is where we go first, not where we end up last. And then you have persona primoris. This is the bug of me first or the bug of selfishness. We're told in that very first church, the one that was born at Pentecost, all who believed were together. They had all things in common, sold their possessions and all their goods. They, pro they, they distributed the proceeds to any and all as anybody had need. Nothing in the world was more important to this early church than their, the well-being of the community. Nothing was more critical for them than meeting the needs of their fellow brothers and sisters in the faith. And so church members who own stuff, you know, they would donate that stuff. They would, they would sell that stuff. And they would, as a result, it says that in that early church, there was not a needy person among them. And then finally, and most crippling of all, you have fides absentis, that is the bug of absent faith or the bug of unbelief. Too many of these bugs and... 
The church just flat out fails to respond to the power of the Spirit. And as a result of that, it can't follow the Spirit's guidance, can't be inspired by the Spirit, can't be controlled by the Spirit. Like turbines that are absolutely just gunked up to the brim with bug buildup, they don't necessarily disapprove of the power of the wind. It's just that they just can't quite free themselves in order to move along with it. Now, one of the real problems with this particular bug is that it attracts the wrong kind of attention. You see, it looks pretty lifeless. It looks stuck, you know, sort of like a, a wind farm turbine that's not spinning. You can pick it. It sticks out like a sore thumb. The last thing we want is for people who are not filled with the Holy Spirit running around telling other folks how to get the Holy Spirit. And yet that's exactly what we do, you see. A car manufacturer is not excited about uh, when his car is brought to attention because it's sitting on the side of the road with the hood up and steam pouring out. That ain't no, that's not good advertising, folks. You know? In the same way, God's probably not really excited when the church appears to get all gummed up and stuck and be in a lifeless, rutted place, unresponsive to the movement and the urging of the Spirit. I think God's used to a little better press than that. But you see, there's always hope. You see, this Pentecost, in fact, every Pentecost, we're given the opportunity to get rid, be encouraged to get rid of that bug buildup, to get rid of it all. And once we do that, once all that's cleaned up, then we can, then we can move like the wind. And when we're, when we're spinning with the Spirit, well, we are an electrifying church. And like those first disciples so very long ago, we can be able to bring light and power to the rest of the world. Let us pray. Living God, your spirit flamed in your church at its founding, and we pray that you would spark among us today. Even as the bush that Moses gazed upon was burned and was not consumed, burn in our hearts. Make us your fuel, use us for your work. Unite us in the bonds of community that we may be the church today for others and not just for ourselves. May the communion we know in you inspire us to be as faithful as saints of the early church. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Church, as you go forth from this place this morning, remember who you are. Remember your call. Remember that Christ has placed his hope in you. So go with boldness. Go with grace. Go with confidence. Go knowing that Christ goes with you. May the world be changed because the church is offering life and love and hope to the world in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.